Amen. I thought I thought you were gonna do the last, you know, like <laughs> Amen. How are we doing this morning? It feels a little chilly in here, I know. I know, I can feel it too. But let's get excited this morning for God's word. Amen. Amen. If today's your first time here, my name is Elder Samuel Asante. I actually said Elder Samuel Asante because they constantly keep pressing upon me to make sure I add that to my name. Amen. And I'm so excited today um, because I'm wearing green. Yeah. And I didn't think about this until this morning when I was, I just walked in the closet, grabbed something to wear, and I was like, oh, wow, today's Palm Sunday, and I'm wearing green. That's, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Because back in the day, whenever you think of uh, a day where it was mandatory for you to wear green was St. Patrick's Day. And I went to West Virginia University, so you know what that means, right? You can just use your imagination. But today we're going to go into God's word, and I'm really excited about this word because I stayed up all night to prepare, all right? So I'm, so I'm very, very excited about it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to honor you for your mercy, God. Many, many, many years ago, when we aligned the dates, God, today you did something that you had hindered for two years in your ministry. Matter of fact, three years into your ministry. And God, um, the truth is, those who needed to see were not able to. And it was for our benefit that that happened. But I pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord, as you took the scales off the eyes of Paul, Lord Jesus, if there's any scale or any veil, Before our faces this morning, the Lord, may you lift it, O God. Because your word declares that in Christ, the veil is removed. And we behold your face being transformed from glory to glory. So I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, may your word this morning transform us from one measure of glory to another measure of glory. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord... Open the eyes of our understanding right now in Jesus' name. The Lord, we may understand your scriptures and understand who you are. And therefore, live our lives in alignment with who you are. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you looked at your sermon notes, today we're talking about this topic called the conquering Messiah. Say it after me. The conquering Messiah. Amen. So today marks off what uh, in our Christianese language, you know, we like to name things as Christians, right? We have Easter and we have Christmas. And today we call, uh, call this day Palm Sunday, which is the opening or the first day in what we consider as the Passion Week. Right. So we have Holy Monday, we have Holy Tuesday, Spy Wednesday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday. You guys are like, what am I talking about? That's really what we call these things, right? Now, the interesting thing about calling this week the Passion Week, which excites me as a believer because it reveals something about Jesus with the passion that he went to the cross willingly, For you and I's sake. The passion that he exposed and intentionally given his life in order for us to have value that was lost from the beginning. So when I think about this day as Palm Sunday, opening up Passion Week, it gets me relatively excited because it reminds me of the value that the Lord placed in me that I lost. And with the passion of the Christ, that value has been restored. And that gives me joy. So today we're going to be talking about a few things. Specifically when when we look at Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And I'd like for you to imagine a homecoming parade. Right? How are students y'all here? Oh, Howard, you guys just let me down. Howard students, where y'all at? 
Come on. Y'all are like a, a walking distance away and you guys are acting like you're not here. I say Howard because Howard has one of the most popular homecoming celebrations. Whether it's good or bad, I do not know. But all I know is back in the day and even now, cats from all different universities will come to D.C. to be a part of Howard's homecoming. So Jesus coming into Jerusalem, this is almost like a homecoming parade for him. But the interesting thing was, throughout his ministry, he was not celebrated. Matter of fact, he didn't want to be celebrated. When the people thronged around him, he will intentionally say something to make them upset. Jesus was not a fan of him being celebrated. Matter of fact, he didn't even want people to know who he was. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's good. Tell nobody that. But then in this moment, it seemed like he prepared himself to be celebrated. Why is that? Let's go into the scriptures. Let's read 1 John chapter 12. Our sister quoted that. And I would say that, you know, it's worth the work of the Holy Spirit. And I can truly say it's the work of the Holy Spirit because she had four different verses that she can quote. But she quoted John. And that's what I'm teaching on. So it is the work of the Holy Spirit. John 12 verse 12. To 17, the Bible says, the next day, we'll, uh, we'll talk about why the next day in a second. The next day, the large crowd, you realize the scripture is very intentional. It didn't say a large crowd, but the large crowd. Okay, we'll explain that in a second. It said, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who come in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when he was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him, he said, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Amen. So before we really understand this story we must kind of look at the background of what's happening here all right so jesus is coming into jerusalem and what we know is that people went out plucked out some palm trees began to wave it in the air put their cloth on the ground so that the donkey can walk upon it even the disciples were doing the same thing and they were saying hosanna hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord that is what these men and women were saying throughout this entire time but we know today that a couple of days later, these were the same men and women standing before Pilate saying that we want a murderer in our community and cast this person that we just called king to death. That seems like an oxymoron. How do we celebrate a man that we are about to reject? How do we say blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord when we are ready to get this man killed? How does that happen? But we need to go back in scripture to read a few things. So in the scriptures, there is a promise of a Messiah. And church, I think the reality of our Christianity is if we don't go back into the, the Old Testament to understand that Jesus is truly the promised Messiah, our Christianity is always going to be half full. Because we only believe that Jesus came to save. That's great. But is he the one that God truly promised that he was going to save the nations and turn all men back onto himself? That is the big question. And the truth is, these men and women kept waiting on God for a Messiah. 
They kept waiting on him for a Messiah. The first time we hear that there is going to be a, a Messiah was in Genesis. The moment men sinned, God said that the seed of a woman will crush the head of the serpent and it will bruise um, his heel. That was the promise and the prophecy of Jesus directly from the mouth of God. Are you with me? And throughout the Old Testament, we begin to see so many different promises. Some came to Abraham. Some came to Jacob. Some came to Isaac. Throughout, God kept saying that I'm going to fulfill the promise of Abraham and an offspring of Abraham will be great. So through our history, we have been trying to find who is this offspring of Israel who will be great. Now, here is where there's a stumbling block. Say a stumbling block. Moses also prophesied about this Jesus. And we're going to read what Moses says about this Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 1 to 10. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 1 to 10. The Bible says, And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and mercy and have mercy on you. And he will gather all you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the innermost parts of the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Verse 6, and the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts. He said, your Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. Verse, verse 7. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of, he said, and you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I have commanded you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hands and the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your cattle and in the fruit of, of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers. Verse 10, we're, we're there now. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Amen. So the people of Israel believed a few things. Number one, they believed that there was going to be a promised Messiah because Moses told them. All right. There are two people you don't mess with when it comes to Ju uh, Judaism. Abraham, Moses, David. Those three guys, you do not mess with them. Because Moses got them. Abraham is the one that had faith in God and God literally chose him. Dave, Moses took them directly out of Egypt. And David, his greatest king in the eyes of every Jewish person. As a matter of fact, the flag of Israel has the star of David inscribed on it. Jerusalem is called the city of David. Are you with me? So they knew that these words were spoken of a man who is going to come as a Messiah in the order of Moses. That is the stumbling block. The stumbling block is because Moses exonerated them from Egypt, physically took them from one place of oppression to a place of freedom. Their expectation is that the Messiah must also take them away from oppression to freedom. Are you with me? Sometimes when we rely on how God has done things in the past, it begins to choke 
us when he decides to do things a different way. You see, we see God one dimension in, in a one dimensional pattern. And we create doctrines around our experiences. Un- failing to realize that God can do what he wants, how he wants, where he wants, and for whatever reason that he wants. Are you with me? So they knew that there was a Messiah. And they believed that this Messiah will bring forth a few things. Number one, that he will bring forth some political and spiritual redemption to the Jewish people and unite the people of uh, the Jews that are scattered all across the world. To bring them all back together at one certain point, as prophesied by Moses here. So they were set and bent on waiting to identify this individual. Waiting to meet this individual. The Jewish people also believed that the Messiah would establish a government, all right? And it would be the central government that all nations will subject themselves to. It's actually interesting. There is a quote in Isaiah 11 that is inscribed at the United Nations following this same thought of mind. That at a certain point, there will be no more wars and there will be peace. It's Isaiah eleven ten. Do your own research when you go home. But they also believed that he will rebuild the temple and reestablish a new way of worship. Remember, we're talking about this promised Messiah. All right? So if Jesus is really the promised Messiah, then he must fulfill these things. Otherwise, he is not worthy of being called Messiah. So the Jews are constantly looking for these specific elements in order to pinpoint one person and say, we have found the one who has been prophesied about by all the prophets. So they were looking. And finally, they also believed that he will restore the religious court systems and establish the Jewish law and the law of the land. They believed that he was going to be a righteous judge. When you read in Jeremiah 33, 15, it talks about that. That he was going to judge righteously. So as the Jewish people look at Jesus, when he is coming down Jerusalem, they are excited because they think that they have found the Messiah. So they sing Hosanna, meaning save now. So they're singing to Jesus, saying, Messiah, we have identified you, so save now. Bless is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, proclaiming that they believe that indeed Jesus is the Messiah from God. But then what happened just a couple of days later? If they truly believe that, what happened? If they were committed to that reality, then what happened? How then? Everything flipped on his head. They saw these characters of the Messiah. And they were looking and inspecting to see if they can identify. But then when Jesus comes in, they believe Jesus is the Messiah. For one reason. He rose Lazarus from the dead. Remember, when we read in John 12, I said the large crowd, right? Not a large crowd. When Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, it was miraculous because there were, he had, died, he had been dead for four days. It's not a matter of, oh, he just died a couple of hours and Jesus came and resurrected him where somebody can claim that he was in a coma, he wasn't really dead. The man was dead, wrapped, wrapped and placed into a tomb for four days. Jesus comes, calls him Lazarus. Lazarus gets up. And I don't know if he was, you know, coming like a mummy or if he was walking straight. But he got out. And because of that, news of that spread across Jerusalem. So the crowd began to throng around Jesus because this man has raised Lazarus from the dead. So as an eager man or woman looking for a Messiah and you hear that there is a man in Jerusalem, who has raised someone who was dead for four days, and that person has resurrected, then he must be the Messiah. 
So that crowd who saw, who heard, and pursued Jesus, when you read in verse 11, toward the end of verse 11, they literally went to, they, they went to see Lazarus. They went to see Jesus, but they wanted to make sure that, look, is Lazarus really back? And they spread the news. But the in interesting thing is, there was a collision between the news and the Passover feast. So there were so many different people in Jerusalem. And everybody is being told that there's this man in Jerusalem who just raised Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus was gone for four days. Oh my God, that must be the Messiah. So now they hear that this man is coming into Jerusalem. So everybody, oh chief, everyone, everyone is shouting him out. Hey big man, good job. Oh, you are the one from God. Yes, we appreciate, oh, we heard about you. Yes, Capo, we, have, we respect you. You get what I'm saying? So they were giving him accolades and praises based upon what he has done. But their hearts were not turned or attuned to what God was actually doing. What scares me is Jesus allowed it. And throughout his ministry, he had kept his identity as the son of God secret. So why is that? We'll talk about that in a second. But before that, let's talk about this palm branch and the symbolism that we see there. Okay? In Matthew chapter 21, verse 8. Matthew 21, verse 8 to 9. The Bible says, And most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. So they cut these palm branches, right? Some are waving it. Some are putting it on the ground. You know, some, some, some are stumbling on each other. They don't want to see him. Some are just, you know, fanning him because it's probably hot with all them people, right? They're, they're doing all this thing, these things. So I ask myself, what is the significance of the palm branch? And here are a few things that you must know. Number one, they scattered palm branches on the road for kings and conquerors to walk upon as a victory celebration. It's kind of like, you know, when, 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 you're, when uh, the, the NBA championship and a, and a team wins, right? The, the confetti just comes from nowhere. Nobody knows where it is, just falls to the ground, right? And there's a, a, an infamous moment of, of Devin Booker literally looking at confetti like, man, screwed up, right? From, from last year's championship game, right? So they use the palm branch to celebrate victories of kings, right? They use that to celebrate the victories of conquerors. Keep in mind, that is the mindset that they had of Jesus, they had the mindset that Jesus was going to come in the order of Moses to exonerate them from the oppression of the Romans. So they celebrated him as if he was coming to wage war on the Romans. But the Romans are looking at this man like, the guy on the donkey? Y'all really think this guy on the donkey going to come take us over? Really, the guy on the donkey? You see what I'm saying? So they had their mind set up that the person that they are celebrating... It's like a conquering Messiah who is going to come and take them from their place of oppression to their place of victory, who's going to come and unite the nations of Israel. As a matter of fact, because they didn't believe in Jesus, a couple of years after Jesus, about, 10 to, about 7 to 10 years, there was another rabbi who came who actually checked a few boxes of this conquering Messiah. And actually was able to persuade a lot of the Jews that he is the Messiah until he got killed and then come back. Sorry. Right? So palm branches were used to celebrate kings and conquerors. So by them doing this, they were declaring that they have found their conquering Messiah who is going to come and whether he's going to strong arm, whether he's going to burn Rome, or what he was, whatever he was going to do, he was going to do something to set them free. And sometimes we come to God with our own expectation of how he must execute the things in our life. And when it doesn't happen in that way, two days later, I can't believe in God anymore. 
I can't believe I trusted. I can't believe I prayed so long about this thing and God did not answer. What if the answer was no? A lot of times we don't get mad at God for saying no. We get mad at God for not saying yes. But the truth of the matter is, if they had a conquering king, they would have died in their sins and went to hell. They would have been freed from the oppression of the Romans, but still died under the oppression of Satan. So who would you rather have oppress you? Romans, temporary, 70, 80 years you're gone, or Satan for all eternity? Do you want the Messiah or the conquering king? Are you with me? They put these palm branches before him. He allowed them. He also had been commanded, actually in Leviticus, that they should use the palm branches to celebrate the Lord's victories, right, over the Egyptians. So as a young Jewish boy, you have this mindset that you use palm branches to celebrate victories of kings and victories that the Lord has done or has educated or won for you, and it's also going to be winning for you. So that was the mindset. So the moment they see that, oh, there's an indication, there is a sniff that this man might be the Messiah, they all just found palm branches somewhere, and they just started waving it. Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now, great Messiah. And they began to sing it all. But there's an irony here, church. And I want us to look at these ironies in a little bit. So these people had an anticipation that the Messiah was going to be a military leader, but they were met with a simple man on a donkey. So the thought process that they walked into this situation with is that they were going to have someone to rally up the troops of Israel to bring back like nationalism so that they may overthrow the Rome. But they were met with a simple man on a donkey, yet they continue to praise him. Because if you are a conquering king, you actually march on horses, right? You either march in front of your troops or you sit on horses. There's, you know, a set of horses that go before you and then others follow and then you finally show up. That's what kings and conquerors do. But this man wanted to sit on a donkey. So number one, he was no threat to the Romans. And the Pharisees were like, why are they still celebrating him again? We're sitting here and it seems as if we've done nothing, but why are they still celebrating him? But then as you continue reading the scripture, the thought of these men and women who celebrated Jesus was based upon the reality of who or what he has done Not necessarily who he is as a person. Because remember, Jesus had been in Jerusalem since he was a young boy. These very same scribes and Pharisees were the ones that said this young kid speaks with so much wisdom. But a couple of years later, wanted to trip him up and find a way to kill him. So when you look at how they celebrated him, they weren't celebrating him on the basis of who he is. As Messiah. They weren't celebrating him on the basis of even his teachings. Because that was not Jesus' first time in Jerusalem in his ministry. They heard about this guy. But at this moment, they only focused on what he can do. Raise the dead. And because he can raise the dead, then he must be the Messiah. Church, I tell you something. If you only focus on what God has done for people to submit your life to him, you are in for a rocky road. The reason why is because God looks at us in every situation as an isolated event. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. So if God is going to do something in your life, elder, he looks at how is this going to sanctify you? What sanctifies elder, y'all may not sanctify you, Akria. But then you were praying so hard. Oh God, if you did it for Elder Yao, you must do it for me. How would that change you? The thing that humbled him made you prideful. Are you with me? The thing that caused him to be broken before God made you feel like you're on top of the world and you can do whatever the heck you want. 
God looks at us and our paths independently. So we don't put faith in what he can do. We put faith in who he is. Are you with me? When we allow ourselves to put faith and celebrate him based on who he is, life cannot determine our worship and life cannot determine our praise. Because it is rooted and wrapped in the reality of who he is. And he does not change. So if he does not change, then his ways towards me does not change. His thoughts towards me does not change. And if his thoughts towards me does not change, then my praise and my, rever- my, my, my reverence to him is immovable. Where have you put your praise towards God? Where have you put your celebration and your worship towards him? In the things that he can do or who he is? Because if you look at the things that he can do, the things that he can do prove that if the Romans were to capture him as a conquering king, you kill all of them. But you let them capture you and beat you and put you on trial and you expect us to continue to sing your praise? Aren't you the one that raised Lazarus from the dead? Can't you kill other people too? Are you with me? But because their expectation was not in alignment with what God wanted to do, they changed their position only because they did not come in for God. They came in for themselves. They did not celebrate Jesus because he's the Messiah. They celebrated Jesus because he was going to come and save them from the Romans. So if you couldn't do that and they captured you, then they should kill you. Are you with me? It's an irony for us to come to God, come before God, and are fixated on ourselves. Sometimes we pray to God so that he can allow the idols in our life to actually grow stronger. There are things that you idolize. And instead of seeing the reality that these are idols in my life, you pray to God so that God may bring increase to your idols. And then we say, God does not answer prayer. Are you with me? For years, these men and women were waiting for the Messiah. But the Messiah walked right in front of them. And they were so focused on themselves that they could not see him. When you continue on, another irony here is that knowing the prophecies of the Messiah and actually seeing those prophecies fulfilled was not enough to change their hearts. It was not enough. Look, there's a dangerous thing about us as people, right? When we do not start off on the right foot in our faith and in our walk, we can walk our entire lives being crippled to things that we've ignored. Because these people had it in the back of their minds, how this Messiah has to move, everything that they saw, everything that they read, flowed through that. If he's supposed to be a conquering king, he has to be a conquering king. So even if Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the Immaculate Conception, where his mom, everybody knew, was a spouse to a man, but got pregnant out of the whim, and literally claimed that she was pregnant, it was not a fulfillment of prophecy to them, because until it has a personal influence on their life, Prophecy means nothing. Selfism is a real thing. You get it. Sometimes we look at God and what he does in alignment with how it influences us. So if it doesn't impact our lives personally, then we devalue the essence and the, and the power in that specific prophecy. Are you guys getting me? When God says... You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And because that boy that you had a crush on says he doesn't like your eyebrows, all of a sudden, 
fearfully and wonderfully made is not true because if I was fearfully and wonderfully made, he would have liked my eyebrows. Are you guys getting my point? When we begin to see God's word by how it impacts us personally, we devalue the power in the words. Because the words means nothing to us if it has no personal impact on us. But I'm very sure if he had commented on, commented on your eyebrows that day, oh man, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Bob just said I was cute. <laughs> Are you guys getting my point? Elder Yao says, no, I don't know if you're messing with Bob, but if, if, if you are, may the Lord help you. Amen. <laughs> so by failing to see the word for what it actually is, because it had no personal impact on them, they missed out on God's big picture. And there are a few things that causes us to miss on God's big picture. Let's look at a few things, okay? Number one, if we have religious head knowledge, church, religious head knowledge of God's truth, but we do not walk it out in relationship, it will cause us to miss the big picture. Look, there was a man and a woman who had spent their entire lives serving the Lord. And God revealed to them that before they die, they will see the Messiah. Because they were walking in the truth of what the word had declared. So if there is a Messiah, they spent their lives praying and waiting for the Messiah. And guess what? God brought them the Messiah. When Jesus was born, he was taken to the temple and he was blessed by Simeon. And Anna also saw him. Why? Because Anna had been praying for the liberation of Israel for many, many years. She was walking in the truth of what the word had said. Not just head knowledge. If you can quote scriptures and it's not alive in your life, close the Bible and go and see God. Are you guys with me? They knew who the Messiah was supposed to be, but they didn't walk in relationship with God to have the Messiah revealed to them. So when the Messiah walked right in front of them, it were as if they were blind. Because being full of self will eliminate God in your life. Having religious head knowledge, knowing how the Church of Pentecost functions and how to get ahead in the Church of Pentecost, does not advance you in your relationship with the Lord. Religious head knowledge does not transform. It is relationship that changes. So if you pursue religion, you will be a good Christian. But if you pursue relationship, you will be an impactful Christian. Are you with me? Another thing. Limiting God's solutions and provisions to temporary circumstance of life will cause you to miss the big picture. All they cared about at that moment was that the, Jew, the Jews were under subjection of the Romans. That was a temporary issue. Right now, the Jews or Israel is an independent state. They are not under subjection to anyone. Time just did its course. Are you with me? And the Romans, they had their time and they were gone. And now, Israel is not under the subjection of the Romans. Nobody had to do anything. Life just had to continue moving on. But when you look at temporary solutions, temporary issues, and basically sum up those issues to what God needs to provide for, you will miss the big picture. Because my focus, just on the fact that I can't pay my bills today. God is trying to change the course of your family's destiny by telling you to submit yourself to a period of fasting and prayer. And all you're saying is, what happens if I finish this fasting and I can't pay my bills? There has been stumbling blocks in your family that has kept every single person from getting married at a certain point. God has given you a pathway to seek him and build relationship with him that he uses you to turn the, the course 
of the curse in that family. And you're so concerned that, oh, I got to go to work because, you know, if I don't go to work and I don't find a job that I can uh, make X amount of dollars, that even though it keeps you from church on Sunday, you're okay with that. You've missed the big picture. Sometimes it is the little things that the Lord placed right before us to test our obedience, to see if we're going to submit to his obedience and actually obtain what he is looking to do for the long term. But when we focus on our temporary issues and look for God to provide for those, we miss the big picture. Get us out of the rule of the Romans so we know you are the Messiah. It's a temporary problem. Very, very temporary. As a matter of fact, you didn't need great armies to take over the Romes. It was just infighting. They just fought themselves and they deteriorated. Read history. Nobody needed to come from the outside. God didn't need to send a Messiah to get rid of the Romans. He just let their greed do its course. You oppress people to a certain point. You begin to oppress your own people, and you end up fighting, and then you deteriorate. That's what, that's what happens. It's a cycle. Temporary issues. Temporary issues of our lives cannot be the cusp of what God needs to provide for. And finally, doing religious things out of, the, out of convenience and not conviction will cause you to miss the bigger picture. You hear that? Doing religious things out of convenience and not conviction will cause you to miss the bigger picture. I was teasing El Dayal last week, like, oh, this, we talked back and forth throughout the week. And um, this week, I call, you know, you didn't get a hold of Elder because he's training somebody at work. So I teased him. I was like, oh, you know, since you got this promotion now, it seems like, you know, you've kind of put the work of the Lord like uh, at second base. <laughs> right? But that's what we do. Some of us do that re- like realistically. Where before you got this big break in your career, you were the most committed person on the 12 a.m. midnight calls Monday through Saturday. You were. But the moment that opportunity came in, rightfully so, maybe work a couple more hours. But the thing is, you found found out how to work everything else around your life except your relationship. Everything else, you, you found a way to work around it. But we can kind of, you know, compromise when it comes to the time that we spend with the Lord or when it comes to the time that we spend doing the things of the Lord. I tell people this all the time. Before I got married, um, I was told that once you get married, you know, ministry changes. And it's true. It does. Things, things change in ministry. But one thing I realized was that marriage did not put stumbling blocks before me to hinder me from ministry. It revealed if I was doing it out of convenience or if I was doing it out of conviction. Are you with me? Because if I am convicted in my heart that this is what God wants me to do, I will find a way to do it. But if I'm doing it out of convenience now, it's an inconvenience to do the things of God or to do ministry. So I say marriage is the problem. No, your heart is. Are you with me? (laughs) Doing things out of convenience and not conviction, church, will cause you to lose out on the big picture. Now, if you allow me, I want to make a case for this man who I truly believe is the Messiah. Do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? I want to make a case for it. Okay? So let's read first in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is quoted by uh, Matthew when he read. Zechariah 9, the Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. You realize why Jesus intentionally told them, go and find me a donkey? Because he knew that this prophecy had to be fulfilled about his life. So he told them, go, there's a donkey that's been prepared for him. Where it came from, we don't know. Bring it here, I will ride on it because this word must come true of my life. This prophecy was some hundreds of years before Jesus. But then with the act of him 
mounting on a donkey and pulling into Jerusalem. If it were you, you would look for a Lamborghini, but he wanted a donkey. Rolled into Jerusalem. He fulfilled his prophecy. So because of that, I believe that indeed, yes, he is the promised Messiah. Because if you are not, you won't figure this out. And the donkey is not going to appear in a spot that you didn't put it there. Are you with me? And as a matter of fact, the moment you told your boys to go get that donkey, it would have been a fight. Because they wouldn't have listened. Nothing would have changed the hearts of the people who saw the disciples and said, hey, where are you taking this? And they said, the Lord has need of it. That is the most weirdest answer. You just pulled up in our crib. We see somebody riding a bike all the time. I know the owner of the bike. And you pick up the bike and you expect me to believe that you said the Lord has need of it and I'm just going to let you go? No, I'm calling the cops. Are you guys with me? But because the Lord indeed is the Messiah, he touched and transformed the hearts of these men. That, that was the end of it. The Lord had needs of it? Okay, you can go. Are you guys with me? So when you read, continuing, he said, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Here's an interesting thing about all of this. When you look at the Jewish calendar, today is the 10th of April. So in the Jewish calendar, it's actually the 9th of Nisan. So in theory, the, all of this would have happened tomorrow, right? If you were to date it all the way back. It would have been on the 10th of Nisan. Why is the 10th of Nisan important? Let's look at this. So when you read in Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 12, right? Moses gives the people of Israel instructions of the Passover, okay? And then he says, on the 10th day of the month, you must identify the lamb for sacrifice, the Passover lamb. Remember I asked you, why did Jesus for three years did not want to show his identity as the son of God? But on this day, he says, yeah, I'm the guy. That's me. Messiah, yeah, that's me. See that on the back? That's me. Why did he want to do that? Because on the 10th of Nisan, the Passover lamb needs to be declared. So when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, he was saying, I am the Passover lamb. Are you with me? He was telling the people as they were praising him, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He was saying, yes, on the 10th day of Nisan, Moses told you, you must declare who the Passover lamb is. That is me. So you can give me my accolades. I am the Passover lamb. Now, beyond that, Moses told them that this lamb must be inspected for no blemish. You must make sure this lamb has no spot or blemish. So this is what happened. Immediately after that, remember I told you, uh, Holy Monday, what did Jesus do on a Monday? He went straight into the temple and knocked the, 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 the table changes all over and cleared the temple and said, my house, my father's house shall be a house of prayer, shall be a house of purpose. That's what he said, right? Now, when that happens, the following day, Jesus is bombarded. Read in the account of Matthew from chapter 21 to chapter 26. He's bombarded with questions. From the Pharisees, the Sadducees, like these guys came over to mob Jesus, to find a way to kill him. And he was found without blemish. He answered everything perfectly that they could not find a word or a deed that Jesus had done or said in order to accuse him. So from the time that Jesus declared that he is the Passover lamb. Four days after that, so on the 10th of Nisan, you declare which uh, uh, lamb that you're going to use as the Passover lamb. On the 14th of Nisan, you kill him. That's basically what the Passover was. That's the instruction in Exodus 12. Okay? So when Jesus declared that he is the Passover lamb, from that moment, so when he gets captured on Thursday, what is Thursday? The 14th of Nisan. He had to prove that he is the Passover lamb without spot or blemish. 
So as they were bombarding him with questions, and he was asked, answering all these questions righteously, he was proving that he is the Passover lamb chosen by God without spot or blemish because there was no fault found in him. Are you with me? Now, after that, they examine him. You couldn't fail. So when you look at the parallels of what happened starting on the 10th of Nisan or April 10th to the 14th of April, Jesus was basically declaring to the people of Israel that he is the one that is sent by God to be killed for the salvation of men. But the people did not understand it because still they were being oppressed by the Romans. Are you here? When you look through the scriptures, we see that Jesus came to conquer the true problem of man, which is sin and death. Jesus did not come to fight a human battle. He came to overthrow the spiritual war that had been waging since the day of Adam to the day he died. So if the Lord is in our midst to solve an issue that we've been fighting with from the day of Adam to the day that you see him, what is the Romans? What is the Romans? They are one little figment, arrow, like a a tiny dot of the pie. They're not even the problem. There is a bigger one, which is sin and death. So today we say, oh death, where is your sting? Why? Because that Passover lamb who declared himself blemished or without blemish, spot or wrinkle, that Passover lamb conquered sin and death. So the conquering Messiah did not come and conquer human problems. He came to conquer the problem that seeks to keep you dead forever. And he started that by declaring himself as who he really was. Not a physical conquering Messiah, but a spiritual giant to overthrow the course of human history. This conquering Messiah came and didn't seek for temporary peace, but he came to seek to conquer and give you and I eternal peace with God. What is a problem if I have the heavens against me? What is a life issue if God The Bible says the face of God is against those who hate him. And the Bible says the heart is at enmity with God. What is Roman oppression? They said, Jesus came. These men sought for life from the oppression of the Romans. However, Jesus gave them a new heart that goes beyond any oppression. Which one would you pick? If you never had to deal with anxiety, if you never had to deal with pain, frustration, anger, wrath, if you never had to deal with that, heartbreak, if you never had to deal with that, would you pick that over some temporary issue that is plaguing your life just for a moment? This conquering king came not to conquer a kingdom of the flesh, but he came to establish an eternal kingdom of the spirit. When you read in John 18, verse 36, he looked at Pilate and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. In the perfect world, the Messiah, as believed by the Jews, should have walked into Jerusalem gathered the soldiers, overthrew the Romans, and got rid of Herod. <laughs> Presiding elders say JJ stuff, right? That was what the conquering Messiah was supposed to do. But because his kingdom is not of this world, when he came in and declared himself as the Passover lamb, where did he go? Into the palace? He went to the temple. 
Because his kingdom is not of this world. And because his kingdom is not of this world, when he walks into the temple, and the temple had been made into what he calls a den of thieves, they said Jesus beat people. He didn't. He just threw the, the, the tables over. Right? Just threw all the tables over. But all of this happened because he raised a man that was dead for four days back to life. And people were curious for a charismatic experience with this man when he came to solve eternal issues that had been plaguing man from the beginning. So when we celebrate Palm Sunday, we're not just here because we, you know, it's a, a Christian thing to do or we Christians want to find things to celebrate or about Easter eggs and, you know, those weird bunnies and stuff, right? When we celebrate Palm Sunday, it is the day that we actually begin to see that Jesus is truly the Messiah, that he accredits himself as truly the Messiah. And the life that he walked and the way that he lived his life from that moment begins to reveal to you and I that there is no other Messiah coming. Till today, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. Till today. Because they're waiting for the liberation of Israel. I was told by a Bible teacher a few years ago. He says, you know, Sam, there's no way to know when Jesus is coming. But I can tell you something. The day that you hear that Palestine is an independent state, beware. I asked myself, why do you say that? And he said, because the timetable of God is tied to that little region. Right? What happens in that little region is what affects the entire world. So you can find different reasons and different ways to support Palestine, support Israel. That's, that's, that's your, your, your beef. But the reality is, the issues that are surrounding those nations, even till this point, is a direct point. It, it, it basically points directly to what God is doing in this world, to what God has planned in this world. And what you and I ought to do is that we must be a people of relationship, not of convenience, not of religious truth. If I know all of these things and I research all of these things and I commit myself to all of these things, but then I miss out on relationship, I can miss out on what God is doing right in my face. That's what happened to these men and women. So what is your position today? Are you going to find yourself in a place where you are truly going to say, you know what? Let me build relationship so that I can see, understand, and be in alignment with what God is doing. Or is it okay that you pull up on Sunday and it's just convenient because you got nothing going on on that time? All right? I'm come for some of our guys today. Sometimes it's actually sad because I have been in churches where while worship is going on, people are watching the Premier League. You know, in the Premier League, soccer. Literally, I see that happen all the time, right? I've seen folks say, we're not going to come to church today because there is a, a, a Premier League game that is happening at 8 or 10 o'clock and I got to make sure that I watch it. These are the habits, and I am coming for you. If you're mad, you can talk after church. These are the habits, okay? The habits, the characters, and the things that puts us in position where we begin to do things out of convenience and not out of conviction. And the more we do that, the easier it becomes for us to do. So everything else aligns up with convenience and it's never going to get to a place of conviction. And then when you see someone who is filled with God's spirit, who is doing everything they can because they're convicted of it, oh, he's doing too much. Hello. Let's move from that place of convenience to conviction. Because when he came to conquer, he was not trying to solve our basic needs. He was solving our eternal needs. So irrespective of where we find ourselves in this life, in every situation, let's seek the Lord to see the eternal value in this. So that our hearts may not be fixated on temporary things, seeking for the whole of God's provision to be used to solve an issue that honestly time can solve. Let's rise. 
want you to take a moment today. Really, just, just, just look within yourself. Are you one of these men and women who because Jesus just did a miracle, just raised the dead, and not just any ordinary dead, but a man dead for days, and honestly had no reason to be alive. All right? If we look at our theology today, he was already in heaven. So Jesus had to literally pull the guy from heaven, like, come back, I need you for a purpose for a moment. Are we individuals that have literally hinged our devotion to him on the premise of what he can do and not who he is? I want you to take a moment, just seek within yourself. Where has your heart been moving towards? Moving towards what God is able to do. Moving towards serving him out of convenience. Moving towards seeking to know that I know that Jesus is the Messiah, but it has no impact on your life. It, it changes nothing about you. It doesn't change how you talk. It doesn't change how you live. It doesn't change how you treat people. It doesn't change anything about you. But just the satisfaction that you know that he is your Lord and Savior. I want you to lift up your voice this morning. Speak to the Lord and tell him like, Lord, this is where I am, God. And there's areas where I, I need some work. Just lift up your voice and talk to him. Because it would be sad that we spend our life constantly coming here and receiving knowledge. Knowledge. But live our lives and do the things of God simply out of mere convenience. It would be sad that it would be said about our lives that we knew so much of God but never got to experience who He is. So Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lifting up our church. Lifting up myself before you, my God. Lord, I relish in being able to understand your word. But I pray in the name of Jesus that from this moment, oh God, may my life be testament, oh Jesus, of a man who walks out your word. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God. May every man, every woman in here, oh Lord, who's pouring their heart to you, Jesus, begin, oh Lord, to walk, to walk, and to move in accordance to your word, in accordance to relationship, and not just religious satisfaction. I pray, oh God, the Lord, may we be a people who are not waiting to experience what you can do, but waiting to see the fulfillment of your promise. Oh God, as Simeon waited, and Lord, you declared to him that Simeon, you will not taste death until the Messiah is born. Father, may we not, oh God, find ourselves in places where we are intentional about seeing and experiencing what you can do, but have zero concern about you truly fulfilling your promise. I pray in the name of Jesus, in every area of our life right now, where self is greater than you, Father, may we decrease, oh God, as you increase in our lives. I pray in the name of Jesus. The Lord, may you begin to show us that we, Lord, came to you for you and not for us. I pray in the name of Jesus, may the truth of us coming to you for you. Lord, may you begin to reign in our lives, oh God. I pray, Lord God. Now, Lord, if our relationship with you has been about us, Lord, I pray from this moment, may it be about you. In the name of Jesus, God, may it be about you, oh God. May it be about you. So we may not miss the big picture. So we may be attuned to what you want to do. And not moved by the direction of how our lives are set up. I pray, oh God. I pray the Lord. There is a place where we, we believe that when we seek the kingdom, all things 
shall be added. But where we have failed as God, we have been seeking the kingdom to receive all things. So I pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord may isolate our hearts right now, that we may be focused on seeking the kingdom for the benefit and the glory of your holy name alone, O God. I pray, Jesus, as your word declares that your purpose and your intent for you, for us, is that, Lord, that we be sanctified. Father, if there are good things in our lives that regresses our sanctification process, Father, may you remove it, oh God. If there are things in our life, God, that brings more wealth to us, but regresses us in our walk of sanctification, Father, may you remove it. I pray in the name of Jesus. If there are things in our life that will bring us more fame and notoriety, but at the end, it will pull us away from the sanctification path that you have put us on. Father, may you remove. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, from this moment, may this church be known, oh Lord, for our commitment to see you change us and make us more like you and nothing else, oh God. Lord, I ask that through all of this, as we walk and enter into this week of passion, Lord, may you increase our passion and our zeal for you. Lord, you were intentional, Jesus, to make sure that you did everything in order as the Passover lamb and you gave your life for us outside of the courts. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. If you are our Messiah, God, the true, one true Messiah, who will be coming back to establish a kingdom, I pray, the Lord, may our life be reflexive of us believing this truth and so therefore walk in them. Jesus, we want to honor you this afternoon, God, for being our conquering king and our conquering Messiah. You strangled death and overthrew the rule of sin in our life. So this day, oh God, we commit it to you and we say, with the life that we have, Lord, take it and do what you desire with it for your glory and your glory alone.